trauma is honestly one of the most exciting things that we can work in as x-ray techs. I'll try to talk about it too. Um, my clinical career started out at a hospital that was trauma level two, and it was working its way to get to a trauma level one status. And so I saw that, that progression, right? And that, that is important maybe to understand the classification system related to trauma, that the, the smaller the number, the more acute the care provided by that facility. So trauma level one's the top notch. You can't get better than trauma level one. It means that there's access to at least a burn unit or some neurovascular surgical considerations within X amount of time. It also means that you have a stroke protocol in place that can be executed in less than 25 minutes. Um, there's also protocols for other acute care situations. Generally, there's some kind of life flight um, link to the public. We literally had a helicopter crash once at the trauma facility that I was working at. I regularly saw people die. I saw all sorts of dismemberments and things like that. Um, I remember one time I was setting a man up for a CT of his head and his scalp flopped off of the headrest. So you would see stuff like that on a da daily basis that you just started to live for the chase. It wasn't the gore or anything like that, it was the opportunity to maybe intervene in this person's life in a really meaningful way. And the opportunity sometimes to do the follow-up examination, to go up to the floor and do the post-op sur uh, surgery uh, x-rays or to see the patient again and, and be like, man, you're, you're alive. 24 hours out, you're still alive, you're gonna make it, um, was really, really rewarding, right? So that's what we're talking about today. It is one of the most exciting things that, that we've got. But I've broken it up to very, very simple kind of things here. We're gonna review the key considerations of traumatic death. So we'll talk about what, are, what informs our understanding of trauma as x-ray techs and part of the healthcare team. Um, we'll talk about the occurrence, signs, symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of trauma to include the following areas of the body, the head and the vertebral, vertebral column, the skeleton and the abdomen. The abdomen's gonna be the lightest piece, right? The head and the vertebral column and the, the skeleton's gonna be where we're gonna spend most of our time. Um, and then we're going to dis discuss radiographic techniques. I have pretty much culled all this information just down to x-ray. I'm not going to talk very much about CT. I'm not going to talk very much about other modalities. I'm just going to talk about x-ray because there's plenty enough just to say about trauma x-ray. And we are frontline. When the, when the code comes, there is an expectation in a trauma level one hospital that the x-ray tech is there with the team to respond to whatever's coming through the door. So traumatic disease is most common in individuals who are young, right? And it's also more common in males because we've got this problem called testosterone that makes us do stupid stuff, especially when we're 20 something, right? Um, there's a trimodal distribution. We'll talk about what that looks like. That means that survival rates have these kind of funny um, fluctuations over time. Um, there's a need to work with EMS, with fire department, with police, with people outside the hospital in order to fully integrate care, you're gonna receive parts of information. You may be wind up doing parts of the history. You might wind up doing chest compressions. You might wind up restraining patients. I've had to wrestle people to the ground, right, as a trauma x-ray tech. Um, so you're gonna be working in this bimodal way. You may see people who are handcuffed and you're trying to do their x-rays while they're handcuffed, things like that. Um, in general, on that front line of defense, if we're just trying to stabilize the person, like we just scrape them off the pavement after the car accident and the motorcycle accident, right? We get them to the facility. The very first things that we're trying to do is establish an airway, right? So you'll see the physician very quickly trying to do that. Um, a, a tr control any acute bleeding and then immobilize the, sp the spine and any fractures. Those are the one, two, three kind of responses to trauma, right? Establish an airway, knock off the bleeding, and immobilize the areas that are broken, right? So you can see very quickly where we, is, where we play a, cre a critical role in at least two of those. Airway establishment, I can't get the, the, the tube where I want it. Can you get a chest x-ray to make sure that it's in the right location, that I've not caused a lung collapse? So chest x-ray is required. Um, and then of course, a immobilization of spine and fractures. I think y'all have all had a chance to work with patients who are immobilized, right? Or on a backboard or um, under casts. Uh, has anyone seen someone that's like, had a home cast, like they casted it themselves with like a magazine or had to splint it with a piece of wood or something like that. Um, where I was at was a fairly rural trauma level one hospital, so I literally would see people like, I one time seeing a man who, was, who had splinted himself with a ski, right? Um, because he had a leg fracture and they had to get him off the mountain. So you'd see stuff like that. Um, 
this is what I mean by that trimodal distribution. Um, one, of the, one of the bragging rights that Regional 1 has is that they have a really high survival rate within the first 24 hours. And you can see why that's a, why that's a bragging right. Um, it's because once we get them into the facility, as we get further out from the um, time of the incident, right, so this is time of the incident along the bottom axis of this graph, we see less death. Most people are going to die within the first hour after the incident, right? So if we can stabilize them in those ways that I just mentioned and get them past those first few hours, chances are they will survive. Now, they may have limited function. There may be uh, struggles and things like that. But we see that immediate death drop off, but then we have this early death bubble that kind of bumps up a few hours out after the incident, right? So even if the person was stabilized, let's say that there's a laceration to the liver, right? They come in and the, apparent, the, the, pa the patient's literally walking around and arguing. They don't want you to take them in a wheelchair to x-ray, right? And then you hear two hours later the person literally just died in front of their nurse, right? They're right in mid-sentence. So, those are what we would call early deaths, right? A few hours out after the incident, went undiagnosed for whatever reason, we didn't get the CT scan quick enough, we, didn't, we weren't able to stabilize them quick enough with this deep bleed, right? And then we'll call these things late death where it's weeks after the incident. We see another little bump, right? And that's what we mean by the trimodal. There's the first part, which we'll call the immediate death, the second little bump we'll call early death, and the later bump that comes weeks out, late death. Right? Those are things where we, haven't we have not been able to stabilize the patient. They're in a coma um, and uh, unresponsive, and then uh, for whatever reason, there's an additional event that causes the, the, the death. So I, I mentioned that I'm not really going to talk that much about uh, CT. Um, but I, I don't want y'all to get the impression that CT isn't a critical part of trauma because that'd be completely false. CT is kind of pretty much everything trauma now. So almost all ERs that I've ever worked at have like a dedicated ER CT machine now. That was crazy back in the day. I mean, we didn't have that. The facility that I first started working at as they moved from, from trauma level one, or from trauma two to trauma level one, that was a significant hurdle that we had, was just the transport time to and from CT. So we had to figure out ways to, fi to fix that. Um, but one of the first things, so I'll say these, these two things about CT and trauma, and then just know that, that trauma is really important. If you wind up in CT, chances are you, you could work in some kind of trauma facility. It is very rewarding. It's very stressful too, right? It's very stressful too. But the two things that are important to consider CT's application to trauma is number one, the American College of Radiology's appropriateness criteria. That means, is this the right exam for what we're looking for? Because in a traumatic situation, everyone's stressed out. You've got these generated automatic um, ordering softwares that are just like, for lack of a better word, barfing up orders. Like, so we get the trauma code MVC coming in in five minutes. They put in um, trauma code MVC, and it just coughs up a slew of CT exams, right? Like six CT exams that need to be done just because they inputted that in the computer. So now I've got to go as a CT tech and weed out what does this person really need, right? Do I need to be doing a head CT? Chances are yes. Do I need a spine as well? Well, it looks like the mode of injury didn't require any kind of spinal evaluation. We'll just do it with x-ray, right? But we definitely need a chest, abdomen, pelvis, right? So you, you wind up playing detective quite a bit, working with the appropriateness criteria, the ordering physician, the ordering nurse, and figuring out, okay, what's going to be the best possible way to image what we need to image, but then spare the patient dose. It's especially important if we're dealing with a younger patient. So again, I said trauma mostly affects people who are young, right? Guys more than girls, but you still see, you know, it was a Saturday night or Friday night after the football game, people got a little bit crazy and now this girl's messed up in a car accident, right? Do we need to do 20 CT exams on her? No, we don't, right? Depending on her level of stability, right? Chances are we do need to do 20 CT exams just to get her back online, right? So those kind of considerations are significant. Work with your radiologist and with the ordering physician to better understand that. It's not necessarily something you need to determine solely, but you will be used to arbitrate those kind of things and to provide uh, education about it. Um, Multi-detector CT scanning, 
has kind of become the gold standard for sensitivity for fracture. Um, so there's even Canadian sea sign reviews and these X radiography utilization uh, uh, studies that have been done, and we've got almost 100% sensitivity for C spine fracture with CT. So you can see that, plus the fact that we don't have to move the patient, we can just put them on the, on the machine, on the backboard, scan them, and we're done. Um, plus, we've got the possibility for 3D reconstructions for surgical planning if necessary. Um, really won the day for CT. Um, so compared with radiography, you, you do seven views, it takes 30 minutes, and it's only got a 52% specificity for fracture, right? So it's kind of a no-brainer, right? That's also definitely the case for any kind of abdominal trauma. Um, X-ray is really has very little um, sensitivity for abdominal trauma unless it's kind of in a fairly late stage of uh, disease. All right, vertebral column injuries. Um, it's important that we immobilize the head and the neck and that we work with the patient as they are immobilized and that we communicate with the patient about the seriousness of being immobilized, right? Because some of these people are ETOH or they're combative, they've got a head injury and they're acting crazy, plus I'm trying to get your x-rays done, right? So hopefully we've all learned our mama or our dad voice to where we can communicate effectively with someone who has had a head injury about the seriousness of remaining immobile while we're doing the exam. Because you, a lot of times you will be one-on-one -on -one with the patient at that point in time. So you think about it, this person came in, they literally scraped them off the pavement. Five minutes ago, they looked like they were gonna die, but we were able to stabilize them. Now we'll shift them to x-ray, right? And it's just you and them. So um, in my opinion, if we're dealing with early traumatic death or the risk of it, there's no need for politeness. Politeness, just forget about, um, I shouldn't say this on the record, but you can forget about aid it, right? Because what we really need to focus on is what's important right now, um, especially with trauma, it's the immobilization part. Um, so no, no, no need to be polite about that. Um, there is direct trauma that can occur to the spine, but since the spine is also flexible, we can have these kind of weird <laughs> whiplash injuries that occur as well, as well as compression fractures that can impair neurological function. So I can't stress that enough. The person might not be drunk at all, but they might start acting weird. So as you're talking to them, maintain a regular conversation with them. Ask them goofy questions like, do you know who won the Republican primaries or whatever, you know? See if they're up to date, if they remember recent events, you know? Maybe not the Republican <laughs> primaries, but, but something that, you know, is in popular knowledge, right? Who's the president right now? Um, and maintain that kind of conversation with them. Like, how about those Yankees? Like, those soft skills are important because you're assessing their response time. They're, they're having a delayed response, right? I remember the first time I ever had a patient die on me in CT, that was what gave it away. I'd been talking to them the whole time, and all of a sudden they went quiet, right? And I knew then that things had gotten really bad. I got them off my table and got them over to the ER as quick as I could, and it wasn't quick enough. But it was because I was communicating with them that I was at least able to respond that much more quickly. Um, so don't discount someone. If they say, oh, this is hurting in my arm or this is whatever, make sure that you take their concerns seriously. If they're struggling with pain and they're trying to communicate with you, they're not just saying stuff just to say stuff. Um, and then there's stable versus unstable injuries. So it's something to really press upon patients. If there's any kind of trauma status that they need to be immobilized, let me, let me transport you on the gurney. Don't try to get up. Don't, we don't need to be walking around because they might have a fairly stable injury, right? But then we stand up and all of a sudden the patient's on the floor. So um, <clears throat> anytime we're looking at the cervical spine for injuries, we're looking at the size, shape, alignment of the, uh, the bodies of the cervical spine as well as the spinous processes. We are going to look at the position and integrity of the odontoid process at C2, um, and as well as the orientation and clarity of those facet joints, right? Um, we are interested in what's the relationship between C1 and the occipital bone. Is it displaced towards the occipital bone? Because that's indicative of a C1 fracture, right? Um, and sometimes there's these uh, swelling or fat pad signs. So we can't necessarily identify a fracture, but we see this fat pad sign that says that there's some kind of underlying pathology there. 
So this is the one CT image I will share with you um, because it's just showing that kind of displacement, that irregularity of the odontoid process. This would be very difficult to visualize on x-ray, right, because of where the fracture is at. So we're really just looking, is it slightly off center, right, on that odontoid view? Um, we, when we do the subtractional, this is a coronal view from CT, we can definitely see not only is the odontoid out of place, the, uh, all the, the entire uh, vertebral body has, has got these fracture line across it, right? Um, here is a Hangman fracture, so related to some kind of strangulation injury or something like that. Um, and so the injury here that we're looking at, see if I can point it out to you all, is this line here, very subtle line right here, right? Um, where that actual, uh, because of the force of the person falling and being caught in some way by their head, it caused that vertebra to snap. All right. Anytime we have injury to the cerebral spine, we also should suspect some kind of brain injury. Sometimes these are subtle, sometimes they're more pronounced. Um, so it may, be, it may be a fracture, it may be an injury to the brain that occurred without any fracture happening, right? So the x-ray is going to give us some view into the brain in terms of uh, the, uh, the fracture, but it has very limited view of things like hematomas and stuff like that, which within the brain, hematomas are really serious. Um, so the two types of fracture that um, I've got as kind of pinpointed at are the linear fractures and then uh, depressed fractures. Don't worry so much about the basal or skull fractures, um, although we, we can look at them. They're, they're very um, remarkable on CT especially. Um, but uh, CT again is preferred visual uh, imaging method. Document any changes in the patient condition. And what I mean is the, the response time, patient was slurring speech, patient appeared to be confused during the examination, those types of things the radiologist needs to know because they know, they're thinking in the back of their mind, okay, I need to look at the skull a little bit more closely because there are signs of fracture. So here's those, a linear skull fracture along the lines of the skull um, with an infant. And here's a very uh, obvious uh, depressed skull fracture, probably from the blow of a hammer or some kind of blunt object, right? Um, so not only will we have this depressed skull fracture, the bone would have impacted the brain and caused bleeding within the brain, right? Um, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about brain trauma. Um, so these can happen closed head or they can cause, be caused by something like a depressed skull fracture. Um, they could also be caused by a traumatic brain injury, right? Um, and so that's going to be kind of the overall kind of umbre umbrella term for anything that happened in the course of trauma that affected the brain. Mm -hmm. So the trauma caused a blood clot and the blood clot flew into the brain. That is a stroke, but it's also a form of TBI, right, because it resulted from the clot that came from trauma. Right. Um, so you'll often see on uh, trauma orders, it's already generated the CT of the head or brain uh, uh, x-rays of the skull, TBI, right, traumatic brain injury. Um, the ones that are interesting or uh, important to us are concussion, which means paralysis of brain function, right? When I saw that in the textbook, I was like, oh, man, I mean, that, that sounds pretty serious, right? I mean, we, we joke around in high school about, oh, the kid got a concussion on Friday night's football game. Paralysis of brain function sounds pretty scary to me. That doesn't sound like a lunchroom joke thing, right? Um, uh, side impact is a coop lesion. So this means that there is some kind of uh, edema or swelling on the brain on the side of the impact. So this, generally the skull itself or some blunt object hit the brain and caused edema on the side of impact. We can also get these contra coop lesions. So since the brain is kind of swimming in cerebral spinal fluid inside of the skull, it more or less can slosh around after impact, and then you could have a lesion or edema or swelling on the opposite side. What happened in that case was the brain was sloshing as the skull accelerated in the opposite direction, and it caused impact on that opposite side of the brain. Does that make sense? Okay. Contusion 
is any kind of neuron damage, edema, hemorrhage. It's kind of the umbrella term for these deeper um, forms of trauma. And then if these types of traumatic injury are significant enough, we could wind up in a coma. Or sometimes it's called a persistent vegetative state um, where the person is not responsive to outside stimulus or limitedly responsive, almost as though they were asleep. So we will look at some CT images related to this brain trauma stuff because it's simply not visible on x-ray. Um, but I'm not necessarily interested in y'all being able to identify individually what these different types of edema are or whatever. I just I want to make sure that we recap what brain anatomy is. It is helpful to remember this. So hematomas of, of the brain are just collections of blood, but since we have kind of we're vying for resources inside the brain, and the brain is mostly lipid, it's mostly fat. So if, we, if there's blood that's accumulating within the skull, it's going to create pressure on the brain, which then impairs brain function, right? So um, they're described primarily by their location within the brain, as either epidural, extradural, extra dural, extraluminal, um, subdural, subarachnoid, or intracerebral, where it's within, deep within the brain. Most of what we see is epidural and subdural type stuff with trauma. So here's that epidural uh, uh, hematoma, which looks like maybe there was some kind of impact fracture there as well. It's difficult to tell without seeing it on the bone window, but you have that crescent shape to it um, where the, the blood has not passed the, um, the layers of the brain. It's, it's still um, superficial to the brain and it's be stuck between two layers of the brain so it, it can't pass that that uh, that barrier there but it is causing midline shift of the brain compression of that that side's ventricle and things like that subdural hematoma this is on the patient's left side in this image and you can see now we can see some of the blood is pooling down there around the folds of the brain and so we know that it's crossed that meningeal barrier within the brain and it's able now to kind of pull on the outer layer of uh, um, the dura matter of the brain. It's still causing midline shift but it's not crossing the Fox cerebri, right? Still causing midline shift so it's causing compression of the, of the ventricles and shift. Subarachnoid hematoma, this is, uh, I believe, visible on MRI. Um, so these are, these are generally smaller, but the patient will be just as severely affected. In fact, with the epidural hematoma, the patient may be quite responsive, right? You'd be surprised how responsive they are versus the tiny little um, hematoma here, the subarachnoid hematoma. Um, patient may not, they may not be that responsive. They may be confused. And here's an example of that intracerebral hematoma. It's actually within the lobe of the brain itself. There's ble blood pooling within the lobe of the brain. It's not out there in any of the different um, uh, meninges uh, encoding the brain or whatever, not on, out on those layers. It's deep in, within the brain, okay? Now again, I don't expect y'all to identify these on CT. That was for CT class, but it's just kind of a quick review of these things and why CT is so helpful for this kind of stuff, okay? What I am interested in is, is being able to talk at some depth about skeletal trauma, right? Skeletal trauma is where, if we're gonna put all of our e eggs in one basket, it's an important place to consider. So fractures, I sometimes abbreviate FX, is discontinuity of the bone caused by mechanical force. That can be me direct mechanical force or indirect mechanical force. So we'll talk about what that looks like. Um, if we have delayed union, it means the fracture is not healing for a variety of different reasons, like maybe the patient's continuing to walk around or something on a, a, on a fracture or something like that. Malunion means it's healed in a bad position. Nonunion means uh, fragments are not joined at all. Here's an overview quickly of the bone healing process. So the break will initially fill with a clot, right? It's going to be form a blood clot around the area of the fracture we'll start to see osteoblasts appear around the injured bone. They're basically removing some of that bone injury, the stuff that's dead, right? Then we start to form this provisional callus, right? And we start to deposit more and more calcium. You can kind of see the calcium deposits 
uh, forming right in there and then finally starting to solidify there. So here's what that callus formation looks like on a poorly set bone, right? Um, so we're going to call this uh, malunion, right? And it, we now have calcium deposits around the malunion. Um, so for whatever reason, uh, this fracture went untreated. In fact, this is highly suspicious of child abuse, right? Because we see this as a child. Why wasn't this kid seen by a physician? Um, all these kinds of questions start to come up. Okay, this one definitely is, is clearly non-union, right? So right in here, this stuff did not unify, right? I like this picture, it's pretty clear. Um, so it's not as apparent, right, on the x-ray image, right? I can't necessarily see that stuff is not connecting. It, it looks like there's some air bubbles or something here. That, that looks funny, but I'm not a radiologist, but that is something even the janitor can look at and say, yeah, those things are supposed to be connected and they're not. Okay, fracture classifications. Open fracture means the bone breaks the skin. Has anyone had an opportunity to see one of those? Yes, pretty visceral. I've actually seen one of them happen as it happened. It was intense. Um, you can literally hear it. It sounds like someone just hit a baseball out of the park. Closed fracture means it still broke, but it didn't break the skin, right? Sometimes they're called simple fractures, right? For whatever reason. Um, Impact fracture is when the bone is jammed up into other things, right? So you see these in rapid deceleration. They're really common in femurs and car accidents and stuff like that where the bone is just kind of pile-drived into other parts of the bone. Further discussion of fracture classifications include the comminuted fracture. This is different from multiple fracture, right? Comminuted fracture means that there's one major fracture line and then there's other smaller fracture lines coming off of that one major fracture line, right? Um, we can have what's called complete or non-comminuted fractures. In this case, the bone is separated into two fragments, two clear fragments, right? And those have a number of different names. They could be a spiral um, or oblique fracture where the bone is literally twisted apart. Um, and, but there's two, fracture, there's two fragments that are remaining, not multiple fragments that are remaining. Traverse, where it's basically just gone across the bone, straight across the bone, um, or pathologic in nature, which means that there was something that weakened the bone already and caused the fracture to occur. So here's just a, a illustration showing us those different fractures. For the visual learners out there, it kind of shows us uh, the, the ones that, that I meant. This illustration shows more than I've talked about in the, uh, the previous slide. Just focus on the ones that I've talked about um, on those slides uh, and you should be fine. Um, the one that is interesting, I think, from this illustration is the occult fracture. No fracture is apparent. That's what occult means. You can't see a fracture. It's not radiographically apparent. Avulsion fractures, the bone fragment is pulled away from the shaft, right? So, um, a portion of the bone is just separated off from the shaft, the main shaft of the bone. Incomplete fractures, the, the most famous one of these is the green stick fracture, and we see this quite a bit with youth. And the, the, it's literally, think about it like this, like you had a, you're out in the woods and you find a green stick and you bend the stick, right, a, a soft piece of wood. You bend the stick, it will break along the one side, on the outside, it will not break along the inside, right? Um, so one part of the cortex breaks, but the other remains intact. Um, a torus or buccal fracture means that it's a green stick with a bulging cortex. In this case, a lot of times it's a twisting motion that caused the breaking. So same thing, pick up a, a, a stick while it's still green, twist it until it starts to break, and you start to see that almost like a frayed rope appearance, right? In children, this is particularly indicative of child abuse, right? Is that twisting motion. They say the kid fell down the steps, but what I'm seeing is a fracture that caused, caused by twisting motion. Like you were twisting the kid's arm at the grocery store or something, right? So um, these fractures kind of tell a story. Um, growth plate fractures, this is at the end of a long bone in a child, 
and we use a Salter Harris classification where one is the least serious and a six, Salter Harris is the most severe, where you've got total separation of the growth plate from the bone. It can be quite serious to try to repair that. Um, a stress fracture means that we've had an abnormal degree of repetitive trauma. I run, I'm training for the St. Jude Marathon, and a lot of runners experience this. That's, it means they've needed to change out their running shoes or something with the way that they're running. has That repeated trauma of running has caused a fracture. I actually was talking to a runner just last night who was over at my house that had a boot on for just that reason. Fatigue fractures are more the opposite. You have someone who's not necessarily an athlete and they go out and they decide to go cross country skiing or something. They stretch themselves a little bit too far and we have this maximum strain in connection with unaccustomed activity, right? Um, yeah. And then like I said, occult fractures means, uh, occult just means hidden and it means the clinical signs um, are there but there's no radiographic evidence. I can't see it on the x-ray. Now this is a, a, another very, very important thing and there's an expectation that we understand some of these positional names for fractures and I think our textbook does a pretty good job of talking about the major ones. So I'll be very clear on each one of these, right? A calls fracture is a fracture of the distal inch of the radius, right? But it's going to be angled back along the shaft, right? So impact injury, right, causes a fracture of the radius and for whatever reason the bone fragment went back along the shaft. All right, we'll call that a calls fracture. There will be a dinner fork uh, uh, kind of abnormality apparent on the skin. You can literally see this person. Um, like I remember the first time I ever saw, it was apparent before I even did the x-ray. The, the, when I walked into the room, the ER physician said that's a classic sign of a calls fracture. And I now know what he means. He's talking about that dinner fork deformity where it looks like there's three prongs underneath the skin angled back up the bone. Does that make sense? The Smith fracture is the absolute opposite of a Coll's fracture. We have that fracture of the distal end of the radius, only it's been displaced towards the surface of the hand, right? So the displacement occurred in this direction. And the mechanism of injury is different. Boxer fracture is a fracture of the fifth metacarpal, right? Happens in bar fights. That's where it got its name from, right? Um, in fact, Almost every boxer fracture I've seen has been someone in a bar fight, but I think it was just the facility I was working at. Um, there's other ways to do it, so don't just assume everyone's in bar fights. Although people should fight in bars more often, right? I mean, that would make life more interesting. Um, a Bennett fracture is a fracture and dislocation of the first metacarpal joint. Fracture and dislocation of the first metacarpal joint, right? Um, uh, Montan... Montagia fracture. I'm going to say it's pronounced Montagia fracture. This was a new one to me, right? But it's a fracture of the pro proximal ulna um, with anterior dislocation of the radial head. And I'll tell you this, this one just looks jacked up, right? So I think it's in our textbook. I think I've got an image on here. Um, but if you can imagine, the ulna has been broken so bad that it's caused dislocation of the radial head. So, never mind. Hagia was. He had a weird sense of humor if you liked putting his name on that. Um, a pot fracture is an angle fracture that involves both the malleoli and joint dislocation. They look jacked up too. Once you've seen a pot fracture, you'll never forget it. It requires quite a bit of surgical reconstruction. And the Mesa Nuve fracture is a severe ankle sprain and a fracture of the proximal tibia. Pro sorry, fibula, fibula, the smaller bone. Right, I apologize. So the ankle has not fractured, but it caused enough stress on the tibia that the tibia fractured up closer to the knee. So if you see severe ankle sprains, what this is telling us is x-ray text. The person says, I really sprained my ankle. Well, which way did you sprain it? It rolled inward. Okay, maybe I need to talk to the physician about getting knee x-rays as well, right? Or a tib fib. Because if I'm just doing the ankle, I'm not going to see this proximal fibular fracture. Does that make sense? We'll look at it here in a sec. So here's the calls fracture. You can see that, um, and you can also get fractures on the, uh, on the ulna as well with this, but that radial head has been displaced backwards along the shaft, right? So about 30% of them, I think, you also get a related ulna fracture, okay? Calls fracture.
Boxer's fracture, right? Fracture at the fifth metacarpal, generally about mid-shaft. Comes from punching people wrong. Learn how to punch better is what you should tell those people. <clears throat> Here's the uh, Montegia fracture. Like I said, it looks bad. I would not want that, and I wouldn't want my name on it either, right? Um, yeah. Enough said. But like I, but but just to point out again, we're talking about um, the proximal portion of the ulna causing proximal dislocation of the radius. The radial head is no longer connected to the humerus. This would be very painful if you haven't figured it out. And you can also cause compartment syndrome. Pot fracture, right? So like I said, extensive surgical repair. So please, when you go hiking, wear hiking boots and stuff. Like, so both malleoli are fractured and the ankle is hanging off, the foot's literally flopping around in the skin, right? So they've had to secure it with all sorts of orthopedic stuff and stabilize the malleolus as well with screws. And here's the one that I said could creep up on you, right? This is probably a teenager, sprained their ankle. Which way did it twist? It twisted inward. That's where the fracture is, is way up there on the proximal fibula, right? So if I just did the ankle view, I'm not going to see it, right? right? Yeah, it, that's actually, I think some of that bulges muscle, but some of that's probably just the fracture pushing on it as well, swelling around the area of the fracture. Now here's an example of what we're talking about when we talk about a cult fracture. This elbow is fractured, I can't see it, right? Mm -hmm. So what are we looking for here? How, what do we, what are we looking for? What we're looking for is not readily apparent on this image as you're seeing it right now, but there's what we call an anterior fat pad sign. We see this sail sign where there's a darkening on the film where there's a pad of fat that's supposed to be in the joint space, the fracture occurs and that fat pad slips out of the joint space. So we can see it on a lateral at elbow x-ray, you can't see it on this image, but just know it's an anterior fat pad sign, right? So it is something that is there that we're looking for as a sign of a fracture without actually being able to identify the fracture because of the complexity of the elbow joint. Visceral cranial fractures. These are usually caused by a direct blow. Someone gets hit in the head in a, with a hammer, right? or hit in the side of the face with a hammer. Um, zygomatic arch is a common place of fracture. So the one guy's got a boxer fracture, the other guy's got a big black eye with a zygomatic arch, arch fracture, right? Um, depressed fracture, or it can be tripod in shape, which means it's pushed its way even further in. Um, mandibular fracture, there's normally some kind of ring syndrome where there, there's a, you can see the snap on one side, and as you kind of follow the snap around, it's causing pain throughout the entire jaw, right? Um, and then maxillar fractures, sometimes called Lafort fractures, are classified based on their de degree of severity. So here's an example of depressed fracture of the zygoma. And for whatever reason, the tech decided to put their marker right on top of it. Um, I don't know how helpful that was or if, what, it, what that is. It looks like a marker pointing to it. Um, or maybe there's something stuck in the patient's face. I don't know. Um, I didn't have a lot of history on that one. Tripod fracture of the zygoma. I'm not seeing it. I think it's the wrong picture. I think that's actually the Lafort fracture for the maxilla. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a Lafort fracture. This is all filled with fluid or something. So ignore that image, I'm sorry. Mislabeled. Mandibular fracture. Again, difficult to see on this image, but there's a line right <coughs> here that basically just shouldn't be there. <coughs> oh, and a related fracture over on this side. Right? So that's what we're talking about. When we talk about ring, like you snapped one side and the other, the other side broke as well. Yeah, like you got hit here, broke this, but also snapped that over there. Um, 
Here's another image of the port fracture in 3D reconstruction. And this is a pretty extensive one, right? Um, so we got fractures all through this area, even fractures of jaw. This person's all sorts of tore up. Visceral uh, cranial fractures, this means deep to the area. Um, and the two that we're going to talk about are just blowout fractures. So this means person got somehow hit directly in the eye and the force on the um, optic ca uh, cavity caused a blowout fracture of the rear wall of the optic cavity. So the rear wall was not directly impacted, it was directly impa indirectly impacted by the eye. So we'll call that a blowout fracture where the energy is transferred to the orbital wall and the floor. Um, or nasal bone fracture, these is pretty common fracture right there, um, may require cosmetic uh, reconstruction. Dislocations um, are generally lots of fun because if it's a shoulder dislocation, you can put it back in and the patient feels like a million bucks, right? But there's some dislocations that are much more severe. Um, so it's important to be uh, familiar with those terms. Dislocation, luxation are synonymous. Subluxation means uh, partial dislocation. Um, with shoulder dislocations, we're interested in is it ant or is it post? So we do the, the AP view of the shoulder and then some kind of side view, whether it's a Y view or um, some other uh, type of lateral view to determine whether it's uh, posterior or anterior where the, uh, the humeral head went. Um, and it may be helpful to do that uh, West Point method in order, in order to view the, uh, that hill sacs deformity related to dislocation as well. Do y'all remember the West Point stuff for shoulders? Go back in murals and look at it. We were just looking at it with the juniors recently. Um, okay, hip dislocations can occur. A lot of times they are related to other previous uh, exi uh, previous existing problems, so that's what we'll look at here sec uh, next. And then acromioclavicular AC tears, so we have um, tear in the ligaments which causes a dislocation of the acromion from the, cl uh, from the clavicle, the acromion process of the scapula from the clavicle. I actually have an AC tear on this side and a broken clavicle on this side, right. so pretty common areas of fracture. Um, neither one of them hurt terribly. Dislocation of the hip, I don't know, this just looks painful to me. You can see the hip's definitely not where it's supposed to be. Like I said, if we're doing this kind of thing in general, um, there's some other pre-existing condition that contributed to this. So we see it with, for example, cerebral palsy, where individuals already have a great degree of internal rotation of of their femur, so they call it the femoral antiversion, where they, they walk like this, and there's already stress there on that joint, some additional thing causes the dislocation, right? Dislocated knee, I have no clue how this happened, um, but yes, you can dislocate your knee. It sounds terrible. I mean, I, I've never seen a dislocated knee in my life, so when I saw this image, I, I kind of jumped on it. It looks like it's probably secondary to the surgery, so who knows, maybe this was Dr. Death, I don't know. Um, but uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I'm guessing that this dislocation is primarily related to the surgery that was done, right? Because um, that, that's it, mostly what we see is like uh, tear, ligamental tears and things like that, or just fractures at the level of the knee. Subluxation, so you can see on that uh, third digit subluxation where um, is dislocated partially, right? It don't look like fun, but frankly, they probably could have put it back on themselves, right? They just manned up a little bit. They put on their, their big girl cowboy boots. Yeah, they probably don't want to do that. I don't know. There's something cool about resetting your own bones, though, you got. It's like the best part of all those X-Men movies is when Wolverine comes back and resets his own bones. All right. All right, all joking aside, battered child syndrome is real stuff, and uh, this is a, a, another time when we need to put on our, our kind of uh, detective hats and do a little bit of homework as we're talking to the patient or, their, more specifically, their, their caregiver. 
you know, just realize if you're dealing with a patient for a skeleton survey, you may not be talking to the birth parent. It may be the foster parent or someone else, the DCS worker, or someone who's there with you. So don't get all weird and coy with them, thinking that they did the, the child. They may not have. The child may already be in state custody, and you're working with the foster parent or something like that. Um, so go ahead and, and press for information. And if that is your job, is to get a family history, um, physical signs, like what, what's the, how's the child behaving. Um, and uh, a lot of times you can necessitate some kind of skeletal survey. Um, shaken baby syndrome, we're talking about uh, problems within the spine or within the areas of the rib cage, posterior rib fractures in particular, are highly in indicative of abuse, right? Because you don't break your ribs on the front you, or in the back. You break them on the side, right? Mm -hmm. And kids don't break their ribs, period, because they're made like basketballs. All their bones are like rubber, right? So you grab the baby and like, you have compression fractures along the back of the, the, uh, the rib cage along the area of the thoracic spine. Why? Because it, they're being squeezed, right? So that doesn't happen falling down the stairs. So get a good history, ask them what's happening, um, and it is required to report suspected cases. I want to emphasize that Tennessee state law says that anyone with knowledge of abuse is required by the state to report it. It does not say any doctor with knowledge of it. It doesn't say any nurse with knowledge of it. It says anyone with knowledge of suspected abuse is required by the state to report it. So if you're practicing here in, the, in, in Tennessee, state law says that it's required for you to report it. I would suggest that um, communicate with your physician, the ordering physician or the radiologist, hey, here's the family history, here's um, the x-ray, I think this is highly suspicious, what do you think, and initiate the conversation that way. Okay? But if you feel like they're gonna cover it up or they're not gonna say anything, you know, proceed as you think is ethically fit. Avascular necrosis means that we have bone death because there's not blood supply. That's what the avascular means, bone death without blood supply. Um, it's typically gonna happen in these bigger uh, joints like the hip, the knee, the shoulder, um, sometimes with the scaphoid bone. Um, MRI is going to be our uh, modality of choice. This can be caused by disease. That's what idiopathic means or idiopathic means, or it can be post-traumatic. So there's some kind of trauma. It's causing redu reduction in blood supply. Here's an example of an idiopathic um, fracture there of the hip. Trauma of the chest and thorax. About 25% of all trauma deaths um, occur from chest injuries. And so we will be called to the front lines to do chest x-ray shortly after any kind of uh, motor vehicle accident or, or trauma. Um, I felt like this was a really good example of a pneumothorax. So you can actually see right here the line that there's an air bubble right here trapped between the lung and the chest wall. Some terms related to this, uh, trauma of the lung is atelectasis, which means incomplete lung expansion. This can be caused by the trauma itself. It also can be caused by uh, inappropriate placement of a tube or things like that. Um, so we'll see an elevation of the hemidiaphragm. That means that side's diaphragm on the affected side and a decrease of the intercostal space. The ribs are compressed. So we see the, the diaphragm elevated, the ribs compressed. Um, uh, compression atelectasis means that there is blood or a fusion or a clot or a lesion of some kind that's causing the lung to, com to collapse, right? Um, plate light atelectasis is, is describing its actual radiographic appearance and generally this requires some kind of radiation therapy intervention. So here's examples of atelectasis here. This is not the best x-ray, but we can see that elevation of the uh, right side hemidiaphragm, as well as compression of the rib space compared to the other side. This is that uh, plate atelectasis or plate like, right, where we can see like an actual, it looks like a little dinner plate right there where the lung has been compressed. We, we also still see the elevation of that hemidiaphragm. Um, 
Abdominal trauma accounts for about 15% of uh, traumatic deaths, and most occur within two days of the accident, um, usually as a result from sepsis or infection or stuff leaking around inside the abdomen. Gunshot wounds, stab wounds, blunt trauma are the, often the culprit, um, and acute abdominal series of radiographs can be helpful. Probably the main thing that we're going to see in the case of abdominal trauma is a pneumoperitoneum, which means air within the peritoneum. It's sometimes classified with a football sign. And we'll talk about what that is. We'll sh I'll show you a picture. It basically just looks like a football. Um, but again, CT is the, ad is the modality of choice for any kind of abdominal trauma. So we have your blunt trauma to the, the liver. We see that uh, collection of edema around the liver, swelling in the liver. Um, something, this is not right. None of this over here, right? And here's that football sign where we can see there is a whole lot of air in this person's belly that shouldn't be there, right? And it's football shaped roughly because that's what it's constrained to is that uh, part of the peritoneal cavity. And here's a brief discussion of rather than the additive or subtractive pathology stuff, your techniques are pretty much the same unless you're shooting through a cast. And that's really just the old school casts, like the plaster casts that are wet. Um, so for most of the fiberglass casts, you can just use traditional x-ray techniques and you're fine. But rather than look at the additive subtractive, what I've got here is different modalities, where the modalities fall, right? So um, an example of a test question, of a test question for, the, for this is something like, with battered child syndrome, what is going to be the modality of choice? Right? It is radiography. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of the lower dose, dealing with the child. 